I'm going to be hanging back your test. Okay, I got one rule about the test. So we're going to take it up and we give you the multiple choice answers. Uh, so you know if it's A, B, C, D, or what it is. Oh, I'm an idiot. Right. I didn't bring the question sheet. I'm going to grab somebody who got perfect on the multiple choice <laughs> and I'll give you the answers uh, just to make sure that they're correct. Okay? Uh, we'll go over the short answers as well. I'm going to go back paper. I've got a top of my keyboard in my office. I'm going to do this. No, I know exactly. I'm all worried about that. I've had it here and I grabbed the papers on the other side and I left it. Anyway, uh, the short answers, I'll, I'll, I'll take those up as well. Um, I'll just quickly talk about uh, what the responses should be uh, for those. Um, and, that's about, and that's about it. I don't discuss the test today at all. Zero, don't send me an email. It'll be ignored. Don't come speak to me. I will ignore it. The only reason why you should talk to me today is if the calculation is wrong in your multiple choice. Yeah? That is the only reason we'll have a conversation. If you request a regrade, yeah, you're going to wait 24 hours, which means you're not going to email me or contact me in any way until 1.20, yeah? Because it's going to take about seven minutes to get to the So until 1.20 tomorrow, yeah? Is that fair? You know why I do that? Because then the emotion goes away. That I'm an A student, but I got a B. I need to pass, but I fail. Yeah? You need to read why you got the grade, and if there is a problem, any problem, yeah? Then you can request a regrade with explanation as to why. You got explanation, I do not regrade. Is that fair? Yeah? The reason for that is, I'm not going to regrade and issue the same grade again. Doesn't make any sense. Right? You got to tell me why. What, what did you get wrong which was correct? What did you answer right which was wrong? Yeah? Be aware that if I do regrade, I don't get upset with regrades. I don't maybe you think that your instructors get upset. I don't care. I'm happy to regrade. If there's an error, then you deserve to have a regrade. Yeah? You deserve it. Okay? You're right. But, I do want to make something clear that if I regrade it, yeah, the grade can go up or it can go down. So you need to be 100% certain that there is an error. Make sense? I mean, you need to be certain. Okay? Today's going to be a very administrative type of day. You're going to hand these back, we're going to take them up, and then I'm going to talk about the assignment, and then we'll get into the lecture. So hopefully, you know, we can get through this. Uh, relatively quickly so that we get some contact. Sounds good? Yeah? Okay. So bear with me if I, if I butcher your names and tell you a quick story before I start reading this. It's a like complication. Yeah, a complication on stage. The, the shake hands for certificates. I'm mean, the academic coordinator for a certificate program which runs out of the Chang School. So I've got to be on stage to shake hands. So on stage, the, the, the program director uh, for the Faculty of Art at the Chang School is reading out the names. And so when you communicate, you have this little like paper. You walk up, you hand the paper, she reads the paper. You can change it and write your name phonetically, whatever. So she says all these names. Some of them are quite Difficult, right? Like, I mean, especially when you have a certain, you know, kind of your ethnic background, you don't know how to pronounce it. Some of them are complicated anyway. It was at the end of the actual service, I felt so bad for this, this woman, the program director, at the Harvard Outer, because this person comes up who had a very non ethnic name, and I think she, like, messed it up a little bit, and she was angry that she got all the ethnic names right, but not hers. Um, and she made a big deal about it. Like her name was like Rebecca or something. But I guess because like in your mind you're like trying to, I don't know, it just, she just said it, right? Lost her mind about her name being pronounced incorrectly at complication. Um, so I hope I don't offend anybody at that point. 
that they, they, they went around to like yell at me because I got their name wrong. Gregor? Uh, I think, I hope it's an A or an A. Oh, Sonhab or Sonhab? Erica. 
Technical paradigm shifts. Yeah. Technical economic paradigm shifts. Those are the four. Discuss how changes in communication technology and information technology contribute to new technical economic paradigm shifts. So that was you're discussing basically the fifth the K, the fifth K wave. All right, we have the convergence between the two. Yeah? Make sense? Okay? Each question or the question was worth um, ten points, five marks allocated for each one, so part A and part B. Make sense? Okay, so take a look at it. The answers are there for you. If you have any issues, okay, you can let me know. As I mentioned, in a class, the only people that should be coming and talk to me, excuse me, about the test, who did not receive it yet, um, and individuals who had a calculation error. Yeah? So something was partly correct, right, or vice versa. You can come see me because we can make that correction pretty quickly. Something already there as well. Yeah? Discalculated or whatever. You just come see me and we can deal with that. I will not be regrading today. I will not be having any conversations about regrading. Okay? Uh, go home, look over it, really read it, identify whether you know that question is correct or not. Right? I mean, we all know deep down inside whether you know whether the grade is deserved or not. Okay? So don't waste my time. It's not. Make sense? Okay, if it is, no problem. No problem whatsoever. If he's going to clarify, no problem. I'm going to do that for you. Okay? But not today. Fair enough? Yeah? Awesome. Okay. Um, the next thing we're going to do, real quick. over the assignments. Everyone had a chance to look at this, I'm assuming? I hope so. At some point. Um, okay. If due on June 7th at 1 p.m. for 30% of your final grade, I want to make something clear. If you committed to turn it in, I'm going to make turn it in available next week. Okay? It'll be available next week. It's your responsibility to get this in at one. If turn it in, and I make this clear because I always have a lineup of students and it irritates me. Yeah? Like it absolutely irritates me. If it's due at one o'clock and you tried to get on at one o'clock to submit it and it didn't happen and it gets stamped at one at one oh five, it is late. No ifs, ands, or buts. Everybody's expected to get this in. I don't care what the excuse is. Does that make sense? Yeah, we all clear on that? I do not want to hear any excuses. That turn it in wasn't working, it wasn't functioning. It's going to be up there. Yeah, it's going to be live as of Monday. Okay? You need to give yourself time so that you are submitting on time. Technology, uh, technology not functioning only works if it doesn't function for the entire class. That argument doesn't work when one person decided to log on at 12.59 and the loading time for the paper took a minute and a half. Does that make sense? I will not have those conversations. You know well in advance it's due at 1 o'clock. You know that you have to submit it to turn it in. I do not want a hard copy. No hard copy is necessary. It has to be at turn it in. By 1 o'clock it needs to be stamped and submitted. This does not mean you log on at 1 o'clock and submit. If you do that, it will be late and you will receive full late penalties. <coughs> yeah? Is that cool? The reason why I do this is because at what point do I cut that off? Someone submitted at 1201. Okay, let's accommodate the person at 1201. 1202. Okay, let's accommodate the person at 1202. Okay, 130. Okay, let's accommodate the person at 1. Okay, 2 o'clock. It took an hour. You know, it's only an hour. Okay, two hours, four, five, six. At what point do I cut it off? Does that make sense? So if I can't be consistent and fair with everybody, then that's not fair for the people that have to get online and submit it early. Yeah, so I do not enter I don't care if it's one minute, 50 minutes, it doesn't matter what it is. You're going to be allocated late penalty based on that time. They get timestamp to me. You get timestamp the same time that you receive. Yeah? And I get a different one. Okay? Also, the first question I've given to students before, 
Okay, I want to make something clear to you guys about buying, paying people to do your papers for you. First of all, um, I'm technologically savvy. Yeah? A little bit. Just a little bit, okay? Um, I can go online and I can see what's posted and what's not posted, what's available and what's not available. Um, I do this every semester. Um, all the resources that are available to you, I am aware of. Yeah? It's not rocket science. If you found it, I can find it. Make sense? Don't do it. It's not worth it. Uh, this is a, these sort of stories circulate all the time, and I never really believe them, and it happened one time to a buddy of mine who also teaches at Ryerson. He's full time, he's a tenure track faculty, he's a full professor at Ryerson, but he teaches a course at St. George. He had a student who submitted, it's a true story. I never believed this, I always heard the story, people would say it all the time, and I'm like, ah, yes. And he showed me the email, and I was like, oh my god. I can't believe this just happened. All right, so he had a big paper. He gives the same a typical assignment every single semester. Um, it's one that requires this. Is, you know, your retail geography class here? There's a marketing geography class at St. George that does the exact same about you guys. Okay? And the assignments are similar. So, anyway, the student decides to pay somebody to do the assignment for them. Well, the person that would be paying to the individual. So, I'm sure you've heard this story before. I never believed the story until it happened. And I like, so my buddy calls me up, sent me a message, he got he called me in my office, I come to my office I quickly, I get to his office, he shows me the email. I read the email, my jaw dropped. It basically said, uh, student ABC did not, uh, the, the paper that was submitted I wrote for them, uh, it was horrible. Uh, the actual greatest sign of the paper was that, which is even the funnier part, the guy paid for something. I don't know if it was male or female, but they paid for something that was not even properly done, which is hilarious. Um, then they didn't make payments, and so the person that wrote the assignment for them, I would go. Yeah? Yeah? Basically said, hey, this paper was not written by the student that wrote it for them. They were supposed to pay me 100 bucks and never paid me. I think it was $75 was what the fee was for this paper. It was a small payment. Yeah? 75 bucks, payment was never made, and that was it. Do not plagiarize. Do not get someone to write this thing for you. First of all, it goes to turn it in. You better be damn certain that the person that wrote it for you didn't plagiarize. Yeah? If it gets flagged, anything over 15%, I look at. Under 15%, the TA looks at. If they're concerned about it, they let me know. Minimum anything over 15, I look at. Yeah? You with me? Zeros will be assigned for plagiarism. Ignorance is not an excuse. We've talked about this already. If you don't know how to properly cite things, you need to go figure that out. If you don't know how to figure that out, then you need to come see me and I will help you figure it out. Yeah? But you are now warned. Yeah? Ignorance is not an excuse. You're all senior level students. You should have done this before. You should know how to paraphrase properly. You should know when to use quotations. Yeah? If you're taking information which is not yours, I need to know that. If you're taking information which is Word for word from another source, I need to know that. If you're taking information and you paraphrased it, I need to know it. Yeah? I'm not can't guess. I need to see where the source is coming from. I need to find that source and be able to identify these things. Be very careful in how you do this. Okay? The system flags it for me automatically. Not only does it flag it for me, when I double click everything that comes highlighted that is coming from another source, it actually brings me to the other source. It turned it. I click on it twice and it takes me to the source. At which point I can read that source. Yeah? And I can identify what you did, how you did it, and the reasons why you did it. Does that make sense? I can track that. It's not it's not very complex. Yeah, there's a that there's a database. Yeah? There's a database with every submitted assignment and basically anything you can find online. And it gets filtered and gets stamped. Yeah? And then they append the source for you so that you can see it in view. Are there some people that get 15, 15% or higher than 50% because they do a lot of quotations? Sure. Uh, concerned parts, like, like for example, one thing that people do is they take the actual question they embed in the work, in, in, uh, in the thing, and that gets flagged. Yeah, like I, I go through in detail to make sure that it's not like an error or something being flagged for no reason. But before you submit this thing, you need to be certain that you have not plagiarized. Yeah? Again, if you don't know how to do it, there are lots of resources available. Right? We had Jack from the library come and talk to you about that. He actually posted some of those resources on Blackboard for you. Um, 
um, alternatively, you can come see me and I, and I can direct you as well, um, as well. Okay? Any questions about that? Yeah. Is that you use any citation you want? I prefer APA, uh, but um, if you are like adamant against the APA for whatever reason, I mean, these things are specific by uh, your department, right? I prefer APA because I'm a geographer, that's what I use. Yeah? That's our standard. Uh, for you guys, it might not be. Uh, as long as you're consistent, I'm okay. Yeah? If you're not sure what to use, use APA. Make sense? You're going to pick one of these two questions. One of them is a concept oriented question, and the other one's an industry oriented question. I don't care which one you pick. Whichever one you pick, um, to be honest, the industry oriented one is probably a little bit more difficult. Yeah? It's a tad more difficult uh, than the concept oriented one. Uh, but, I mean, they're not, not insanely more difficult. Like, it's not that you're at a disadvantage if you choose that one. It's just. Uh, we, we talked about this every week. We'll talk about this every week. Uh, less sources on this kind of stuff, you need to be more specific. If you have a better understanding, a lot more sources here. But so finally, do that kind of stuff in terms of what you want to select. It could be somewhat complicated. So keep that in mind. Anyway, first question is technological progress is, a, is commonly advanced uh, as a principal driver of globalization. Yeah, we've talked about this already. While technology is old, Almost certainly an important factor contributed to globalization is not the only one. Provide critique of technology as the primary force behind globalization. Yeah? So we talked about this in the first class. I talked about the state. In my opinion, the state. Someone might think TNCs. Someone might think whatever. But it's not, those things are not, technology doesn't happen on its own. Yeah? Technology allows things to happen, but the reasons why they happen is not because of technology, it's because there's a monetary, there's an incentive, there's a value, there's a reason, an economic reason behind it. Yeah? And so now you need to critique that argument. Yeah? Does that make sense? You think about how we define technology is defined in multiple ways, so that should get you started thinking about um, that question in a bit more detail. Yeah? So I need my perspective. I think the state drive technology. You don't want to take that perspective, you can take another one. I don't care what perspective you take, it does not need to be my opinion. It needs to be backed up. That's all it is, right? You need to critically evaluate uh, those things. Yeah, that you see. Yeah. So you're saying it is or isn't? What are you saying? Uh, you can say, oh well, or you can be on the fence if you really wanted to. Yeah? Like so for example, one of the technology in practice, you know, the idea we talked about is what can we first a chicken or the egg, right? So does, once the technology is sort of created, does it all of a sudden get manifest? Like does it does, does it take on like a you know state of its own and starts to evolve, yeah, because that technology exists? Sure, maybe, right? There's some things that because it, because that technology exists, if you try to perfect that technology, things become quicker, better, faster, and it's being done on its own, right? Like it's almost a byproduct of technological advancement. Sure. Um, technology allows people to do certain things. So for example, Canada starts to trade with, the, with China, yeah? It's easier to have trade happen with China, you see this increased trade uh, take place over Asia in general. Yeah, you see this happen and happen. Yeah? You see this evolution take place. The reason why they trade has to do with technology, the fact that now they're able to do it. Right? But the driving force behind that trade has to do with economic reasons for both parties. Yeah? What's the value for one place? Who's promoting it? Why do they want to sign those agreements? Who does it benefit? Make sense? Can something exist in a place that the state does not allow it to? Can certain products come in, certain industries? Think about cars. Right? The same question a lot of them, but you can give those the first one. Right? Think, about, think about cars. A car is produced somewhere, but every place that it is actually produced, or where it's actually sold, will have different laws uh, pertaining to the design of the vehicle. Yeah? Different emission laws, uh, height, of their headlights, yeah, or whatever. There's all these laws around what the car needs to look like. There's there's, there's laws around uh, the construction of those vehicles, okay, for the markets that they're sold in. Who creates those? Is it the auto industry? Is it the big TNC? Who creates those laws? Of course not, because it's up to them, yeah? They would abolish the law, they make one vehicle on one platform and sell it to everybody because it's cheaper. But the states regulate that stuff. 
Yeah? There's taxations for every car that's not produced in the market that it's sold in. Yeah? Changing the price tags of those vehicles. Who controls that? State. Yeah? Does that make sense? These laws are put in place by those parties. Okay, so these are things you need to start thinking about. What's driving globalization? What's first of all, what's globalization? One word. Interdependence. Yeah? What promotes that interdependence to take place? Who controls that? Does technology control that? In my opinion, technology allows that. Doesn't control it. Doesn't drive it. It allows it. Make sense? Well, it's just, it's not thinking very much. Yeah. Look, you can have a different opinion. You need to back it up. I'll tell you though, it's extremely hard to tell me that technology is the driving force. Yeah, it's really difficult to make that argument. So be very careful if that's the argument that you choose. Because if you sat there and said, well, no, I mean, we should, you know, we, uh, they bought papayas in the UK because of the airplane. Well, no, maybe, you know, that fruit is brought to that marketplace because the consumers, yeah, are different. I mean, those fruits are coming to that marketplace because there might be some trade agreements between Jamaica and, and Britain. Uh, the papaya might be going there because of immigration. There's a large, Jama there's a large, uh, there's a large uh, population where papaya is consumed in that marketplace now, and those people want it. Those things have nothing to do with technology. Does that make sense? Yeah? So be careful how you view technology or how you make that argument. I don't care if you have a difference of opinion. I get into debates all the time uh, between people about TNCs in the state. So the next two lectures are on TNCs in the state. Today's TNCs. Next to the state. Uh, I get this argument all the time with students. Because uh, students will, will, will tell me the TNCs are the driving force. Yeah? Transnational corporations are the ones that are driving uh, globalization. Um, and they're not wrong. Yeah? They're not wrong. The TNCs can't function without the state. And the argument back would be well, TNC is a lobby for certain laws to be passed to help them do certain things and partake in certain things. Types of activities. So we go back and forth. I'm okay if you have a difference of opinion. So if you want to think the opinion of TNCs and you believe that, that's fine. You do not need to agree with me. Yeah? Okay. Second question. In the textbook, okay, there's an automobile or automotive um, uh, chapter. Okay. Chapter on, on the on the automobile industry. Um, and so it talks about how it's been reorganized, how it functions. What you are going to be speaking of is you're going to be talking about how it's restructured, um, how the uh, sorry how uh, the automobile industry has basically been restructured um, since 2010, and what some of those developments have looked like, what they are, and here's how they changed, um, how they evolved, uh, what do they look like now given uh, changes that took place in 2000. Yeah. Changes uh, by market, yeah. Certain things that have happened in terms of maybe emissions, and, you know, a variety of different things. But you're going to take that and you're going to look at the evolution of that based on what the textbook says and where it's going. What, what the trajectory basically is for that industry. Okay, choose one of them, not both. Yeah, be sure it's only one. I'm only reading one. Breakdown. Okay, what it needs to look like. Please make sure that they're peer reviewed. I always get asked the question. It's a very short paper, it's like 1,200 words, max of 1,500. So that's for two reasons. Uh, one reason, it needs to be graded in time to get back to you before your exam. Six weeks, yeah? Can't be 3,000 words because that would take much time, unfortunately, given the six week condensed format. So that's the honest reason. The second one, it forces you to stick to the point, yeah? Um, I always ask the question, how many sources is enough sources? How many sources is enough sources? Let me ask you this, please. What's enough sources? Yeah. However many you need. However many you need, that's a... Seems like that would be a right answer. Yeah, sure. Does that work for you? If I said how many you need, does that, does that push you off a little bit? Who gets upset by me saying the million you need? Who would rather we give them a number and say you need to have this many? Yeah? 
Uh, the real answer is as many as you need. That's the, the truth based on your argument and what you're trying to back up. That's the real answer. Um, I can tell you though, if you have less than 10, something's wrong. If you have less than 10, something's wrong. Yeah? Because how did you critically evaluate anything with less than 10 sources? Yeah? Both of them. Yeah? If you have less than 10, something's wrong. Does that make sense? If you have less than 10, you know what you end up doing? Is you, you, you go out and you try to find, so the first thing someone just the first question, and this is a terrible way to write a paper, okay? This is what you're going to end up doing. If I told you less than 10, yeah? you're going to find one article which answers that question. You're going to try to find it, you're not going to find one. You're going to try really, really hard. Yeah? You're going to spend about 20 minutes on Google looking for it. Yeah? That's considered hard. And you're going to find something that comes close, and then what you're going to do is write what they told you. What they're basically saying in your paper. How's that critical? Can someone def okay? I mean, what to, to be critical, what does that mean? What does it mean to be critical? What does it mean? If I say think critically, what, 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 what do I expect? What do I expect when I say think critically? Yeah. Different perspectives. Yeah, you're trying to be analytical and critical in terms of the way that you receive that information as fact. Yeah? How many people are saying that the exact same thing that this guy said in this paper? How many people said that? Okay. So just I have I just write 15 articles. 15 articles have the exact same position. Do I believe that position? Is there any articles that counter that position? Yeah? What are the weaknesses? What are the strengths of that argument? When I say more than 10, you're not reading the whole article and regurgitating, okay, this guy said this, I'm going to write about a page and a half of what this guy said, and then this guy said this, I'm going to evaluate that. It's not that you're taking, like, when you write in this sort of, like, you're reviewing literature in this way, what you're basically doing is you're reading multiple articles and you're extracting the argument. And then all you're saying is, look, I believe this is the driver of globalization. Brown, uh, Woods, Jim, Bob, Ralph, whatever, right? They, 2000 and whatever, said, yeah, that this is the driving force, and this is the reason why they said it. But, this guy, this guy, and this guy said this other thing. Yeah, and this person said this, and this person said that. Yeah? I don't ever write the first person, but do not write the first person. Okay? But then you evaluate, you obtain a perspective based on what you find in those readings. Does that make sense? That's all you're doing. You can't do it with less than 10 if you're not being critical. Yeah? You're not regurgitating the entire paper. If I wanted to read that person's paper, I can very easily go and find that paper and read it. So, Right? That's, that's not what you have to do. For whatever reason, students think that they have to take this entire paper and basically summarize it for me. I'm not looking for an entire paper. I'm looking for how do they argue that, uh, that, that, that thought, that concept. How do they argue that concept? Yeah? What are the pros and cons of that argument? That's what you're evaluating. Does that make sense? That's being critical. Don't try to find, you're not going to find a paper which answers that question. You're not going to. Yeah? Okay? What you want, so let's say they take the global state, you want to find papers that evaluate state controls and trade. How the state functions in, uh, like sort of taking the state argument, for example. Uh, the role of the states uh, with PNCs. The role of, of the states in regional agreements. The role of the state in terms of legislation that prevents or protects uh, certain types of industries from either coming in or protect them from, from, from any forms of competition. Yeah, so maybe supply management, uh, maybe things like subsidies. These are the things that you are looking for to make that argument. But you can't look for the right things if you don't understand the question. Or you don't have an idea of what is the driving force behind that. Does that make sense? When I just said that, it's like almost like, oh, I got this. Like, it's not that hard. Yeah, that's the biggest difference. Yeah, a good paper is going to do that. A bad paper is going to try to find an article and then it's going to summarize that one article for me. 
um, and then possibly tell me how wonderful technology is. If you tell me how wonderful technology is, you're not going to do well. Yeah? Make sense? In terms of the automotive side, the exact same thing. What are some, you know, look at the auto path, right? Look at uh, the state's role in protecting our auto industry, right? There's, there was something in the newspaper recently with Ford. You can use uh, newspaper articles um, as sources to sort of uh, get perspective on things, like to gain perspective. perspective right? You wouldn't use it as an academic quality source, right? But, you know, what, so what happened before the thing was in the news with the Ford do? Huh? Did it well? Oh. No, not about Ford. <laughs> Ford, the, the car dealership. Did you say you did crack? <laughs> no, no. But yes, but no. <laughs> so, proper with my football coach in high school. The crack house, that is the truth right there. The crack house is not a crack house. Uh, it's like 250 meters from my house. <coughs> Uh, I went to school with that woman that's in the video with him talking to him. I went to school with her daughter, who doesn't live there anymore, and I haven't seen her since I was in. She was younger, I would like to take care of her class or whatever. Anyway. <laughs> no, Ford. Yeah. Maybe they might have. No, specifically in terms of uh, work. Do with labor force. They laid off a bunch of people, right? Or they're claiming that they're going to lay off a bunch of people. They have government money spent. Part of the government giving them that money, they promised not to fire anybody or lay off anybody to keep people employed. Then they unfortunately went back and said, We're going to have to do it. But their excuse was, No, 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 we promised we wouldn't lay off any line workers. So we laid off management. Um, and so they're going to look for volunteers, yeah, volunteers to quit. Um, they're also going to look at um, so volunteers to, to, to basically retire um, and possible relocation of, of, of other employees, and then ultimately layoffs if they if people don't volunteer or take early retirement. Yeah, why am I saying this? And, the, and actually, the article is a really good point. Uh, they said, we need to stop giving money to a dying industry and find a better alternative, right? To, to take up, you know, a lot of that, that large number of people that it's employing. Does that make sense? That was the argument in the article. I'm not saying I agree with that or disagree with that. That's what the article said. Yeah? So think of all the things that come into automotive. From a workplace perspective, what percentage of our population actually works in the automotive sector? Yeah? Why are we so concerned with it? Why does the government keep bailing out these transnational corporations? Yeah? We're not controlled, do not have no affiliation to the government. The government comes in and says, okay, we need a billion bucks, so it goes down, please. Here's a billion bucks, whatever you need to do with it. Just keep people working. Yeah? Like, like you ever stop and think about that? The government gives them billions of dollars to stay in operation. And they have for many years. Yeah? Not the same people all the time, it fluctuates, right? If everyone's in trouble in that moment. Yeah? So the article talked about this. Why would that be significant? Yeah. How is that changing? How, you know, what's the next 10 years going to look like? The next 20? Yeah. Make sense? And yeah, think about competition from other markets. Other car manufacturers that don't produce necessarily in this marketplace. A lot of these are finding sources directly linked to the evolution of auto of the automotive industry. A lot easier to find an article on that. A lot more difficult to find an article uh, talking about one of these specific things for the globalization. So you have to do a bit more work to figure that out. One's easier to write about, in my opinion. Yeah. Because if you have a perspective, you can find things really quickly to back up your perspective. Yeah, like super easy to do it. Um, so it's not that hard to write, but you have to have a thought in your mind to have a, you know, what perspective you want to take. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah. Is there a in the workout? 
Yeah, I mean, unless you're taking, uh, so the only ones that wouldn't be if you took like, entire verbs or sections from something, you put quotations around it, we wouldn't count. Yeah? Well, I mean, but if you pair it. Oh, no, 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 sorry, you reference place. No, 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 now you tell the page does it. Okay, first of all, I'm not going to count the amount of words that you have on this page. Yeah? But if you submit something that's 3,000 words, then that's a disadvantage for somebody else who's stuck to the 25 or the uh, 1,500 words. Does that make sense? That's a huge disadvantage for somebody who gets their writing to fit in 1,500 words. When you fit in, in 3,000, you will be penalized for that. If you did 1,600, 17 even, Am I going to really? No, no. Yeah? Does that make sense? But if you did something where I, I view it as a disadvantage for people that had to refrain from having exceeding that work done, the difficulty in this is being, you know, being critical in 1,500 words. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah? It's like five pages. It's hard. Yeah? Uh, so if you're using, okay, so first of all, okay, that's a really good question, actually. Uh, most things are available in translation, yeah? So like, like top-tier journals, um, the standard language in a lot of journals is English. Uh, things have been changing in recent. There's a lot of journals that are uh, Chinese, for example, um, working about publishing in them, uh, but they do offer translated versions. If you do use a, a source, I need to be able to somehow translate that. And so you just need to make sure that there's trans, translatable content that's there. Um, most of them will offer an English version to their other language. Even in some places, like if it publishes in like Portuguese, for example, it's a Portuguese journal, uh, they'll require it to be submitted also in English. Yeah? Um, so if you found it and it's in one language, so you should be able to find it in a different language is not that much. You just have to do a little bit more work. But yes, you can. And there's been a huge actually push from uh, uh, in academic journals from uh, Asia. Massive, like massive growth in those. The standard for all countries was English before. Like if you're going to publish in a field, you publish in English. And that's starting to change a little bit. Like you have this a bit of growth in those things, but you still generally can find the standard. Yeah, any other questions? No? Feel good? Can I scare you a little bit? No, not at all. I'm trying to. Uh, a little fear is good, right? Fear will make you do things properly, right? It'll, it'll help you, uh, it'll motivate you, right? To, to, to look for, you know, those types of things. But one thing I'm really adamant on, guys, is, is your uh, citation, okay? Please, 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 please uh, be mindful of that. Yeah, because they lead to uncomfortable conversations um, and ultimately like the boss of grades um, when they you know definitely been over. Okay? Sounds good. Any questions? No? Awesome. Uh, what time we got here? Do you want to take a break or you guys could just keep going through? Okay. Your final exam is the exact same as well, but there's a third section added to it, okay? Uh, but in terms of how the questions are asked, you're asked the exact same way. If you did well, the way you were done through this, obviously, it be identical across the board. Okay? Sounds good? Awesome. Okay, today we're going to talk about TNCs. Uh, what's a TNC? Don't tell me a transnational corporation. Characteristics of the TNC. What are some characteristics of the TNC? 
We need a quick number here, okay? Because yeah, you don't need to write this down. 80,000 TNCs, which operate 800,000 subsidiaries. 80,000 TMCs would operate 800,000 subsidiaries. And that data is from 2010. Would you imagine that number increased or decreased? It would stay the same. That's a tricky question. Mergers and acquisitions are a staple for TMCs. Yeah? Staple for TMCs. So oftentimes what it actually does is it reduces, oftentimes you have an increase in the number of subsidiaries, but you have a decrease in the number of TMCs that are there. Yeah, like in, 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 uh, in the of the retail environment in Canada, uh, as, a, as an example, things that you see on a day-to-day, -day, uh, things are changing hands constantly. Yeah, companies are changing hands constantly. And so usually when, when, when that happens, your company comes in and buys something, they buy usually one of their competitors and they take them out of the market, which actually reduces the number of retail conglomerates that operate in our country. Does that make sense? Yeah? But that tends to be what happens. We think about Sears and Simpsons, right? Uh, if you guys are young, don't remember Simpsons. Uh, I'm sure your parents might talk about it. Um, so Sears came in and had a joint venture with, so Sears was a, I don't know, I may, may have mentioned this already, but Sears went from Chicago to your own uh, from Chicago, uh, Simpsons was a Toronto-based company owned by Robert T. Simpson. Uh, they had a joint venture, uh, eventually Sears in, in the 50s, in the 70s, in the 70s, in the 50s, in the late 70s, Sears eventually took over the entire operation and, and it was no longer Simpsons in the market. Uh, Sears and Simpsons were identical, they were part of the Yeah, so they removed competition by having that, 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 that merger actually happen and that eventual takeover. So that happens all the time. Uh, so it's a trick question. I don't know what the actual number is now, uh, but usually uh, we see mergers and acquisitions as are staples in these industries. I right? see so companies change hands all the time. Okay? So what is a characteristic of a TNC? If I say this company is a transnational corporation, what does it have to have? Yeah. Activities in many different countries. Activities in other countries. And so does that have to be multiple countries or can it be one? Like one other than their home market. Sure, right? Could be one. The whole point of a TNC is that they operate outside of the domestic market. Yeah? There is some sort of foreign presence. Okay, and that's what qualifies. There's other things, and we'll talk about this. Uh, but that's basically the number one thing. So, headquartered in one country and operates wholly or partially, owns subsidiaries in other countries. They coordinate and control production networks in numerous countries. So we with the production networks, that's a huge incentive. Yeah? If you control production networks in multiple places, yeah, you're leveraging incentives, you're leveraging opportunities in certain places that exist that appear and disappear rapidly, right? Opportunities appear and disappear rapidly. Yeah, so what's an opportunity today in five years might not be? What's an advantage today in five years might not be? Does that make sense? Yeah? I always give the example of Viagra. I don't know I talk about Viagra with you guys. Yeah. So Viagra is a really good example of this, just because of the amount of media coverage that it gets. Um, Viagra, right, it, Pfizer had a advantage. They had an advantage until their patent ran out. Then they lose that advantage. Yeah? Did, did I talk to you why those things exist? I mean, yeah. So it costs a lot of money to develop a drug. And so what governments do is say, okay, man, you spend all this money, you develop this thing, there's benefit to this thing, there's there's real value to what you created, we're going to protect you for X amount of time to sell that product. Yeah. So that you can make money. Is that that's reasonable? Yeah? You're gonna put that kind of money in, yeah? We're going to protect you. Your patent will protect anybody from creating any generic version of that drug. Yeah? If you need to do a version of that drug or any alternative of that drug for X amount of years so that you're able to capitalize on the amount of money that you've invested in producing that. Okay. Um, one of the things about TNCs is that they're oftentimes geographically flexible. So if you think about like Ford, for example, or you think about GM, um, or you think about Chrysler, 
Uh, these companies are extremely flexible, right? They make decisions about where production takes place based on the dollar, yeah? Uh, based on any economic change that might make it less beneficial or might, uh, uh, or in an area where there might be an incentive, right? They'll look at these opportunities and move production in those places. They have that flexibility because they exist there already, yeah? They are generally large, and that's a misconception of actually. No, they're not all large. I'm talking about this wave of telecom tech companies. They used to be quite small, but they make a lot of money. Um, they don't have a huge workforce, for example. We automatically, which is the TNCs, have a huge workforce, they're large companies, with many offices, and it's not always like that nowadays, given you know the internet. But uh, again, these things provide flexibility. Their size in terms of capital provides flexibility um, for these businesses. So why become a TNC? Why would a company want to be a, T a TNC? So this is, you know, we're going to look at this uh, from a macro level, and then we're going to look at it from a micro level, right? So we're going to look at it in terms of a global kind of perspective, and then we're going to look at it from the local side as to why they would want to do these things. Um, capitalism plays a huge role in why companies want to be a TNC. Yeah? What, what drives capitalism? What guides capitalism? What's the guiding force of capitalism? Money. Yeah? Profit. The ability to make profit. This is a huge motivation for transnational co corporations to become competitive on a global scale. Right? It equates to the profit. Okay, so they want to make that sort of transition. Uh, there's a lot of companies that are competing in that global, uh, in that global marketplace. And if you don't <coughs> move into that sort of atmosphere, it's very easy to be left behind. Yeah? If you think about a company which imports goods, when we think about TNCs, one of the first things that we think about, I don't know why, um, it's, not, it's not actually true. Uh, we think about exploiting cheap labor somewhere else. Okay? Who thinks about that when I say TNC? Just me? You look, yeah. First thing that pops into my mind, I think about uh, transactional corporations. Uh, transactional corporations, I think about some factory in like Bangladesh where clothing's being made. Yeah? Or a factory in Pakistan where they're making soccer balls. Yeah? Did you know that? Most soccer balls are actually made in Pakistan? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Almost all soccer balls um, are made in Pakistan. With, like the highest rate of soccer ball production anywhere. It's, it's actually really sad because if anyone ever buy an official soccer ball, you're seeing the cost of the official soccer ball? Yeah, like okay. three, three fifty. Yeah, you know how much it costs to make that soccer ball? Like not even. Yeah, it's upsetting. And uh, there was a documentary where they showed the fact that soccer balls being made, and there's like kids, kids like making these soccer balls. They didn't make any these soccer balls for retail for three fifty. Just like crazy. Yes, you can buy three dollars soccer balls. Yeah? If you go to a store and you want to buy the Champions League ball, the official Champions League ball, like you're looking at like hundreds of dollars for a soccer ball. For some synthetic material. Yeah, which apparently does certain things when you kick it in certain ways. Yeah? Apparently. It's obviously not that good at soccer. That, that the ball affects anything. Yeah? And <laughs> then soccer shoes. Please. Like people spend all this kind of money on pizza that makes them do things better. Uh, anyway, so we see these, you know, we, we automatically think of those types of things, these factories where you have child labor, uh, where, uh, you know, you're leveraging cheaper, you know, uh, where there are conditions that aren't the same as here. So you can pay people less, no union, no regulation, you know? And so, you know, things are being made and produced for a lot cheaper, which means that we can sell it for a lot less and we can make profit on it. And yes, that does exist. Yeah? That definitely does exist. Um, but sometimes that production chain, yeah, that exists, right? That production process that exists in some other places um, goes beyond, yeah, it goes beyond uh, just cheap labor. Um, it can be a certain type of expertise. Think about Japan. What's just in time? Just in time, that. Well, if, if I say just in time, what? What do you think of? Just in time. 
Yes. If I talk about lean production and just in time, yeah? What do you think of? Inventory being available when you need it. Inventory being available when you need it. What else? It's an inventory system. Just in time technology is an inventory system. It allows you to not hold as much inventory. No. Yeah? There's, if you hold a lot of inventory, it requires a lot of capital. Yeah? It makes you less mobile. Um, if you can basically uh, purchase things as they are required, and you have an advanced inventory system which allows you to do that, that's a huge incentive. A major, major incentive, right? You have less capital invested in holding a uh, um, uh, product. If, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I have conversations with my friends all the time about like, like different business ideas and things that we can do. And one of the biggest things or hurdles that we get to is what the overhead cost is going to be. Yeah? We like businesses that have no overhead, so if it fails, it can cost us anything. Yeah? And that's the best business. Yeah? I can take a risk, but there's no risk. There's time. Yeah? Just time. Yeah? So think about how much money is usually held in the inventory. That's a problem, right? Um, so again, they, they, they increase efficiencies by this method, and they decrease uh, basically any waste by receiving uh, goods, only the goods and services or whatever things that they need at that time. Uh, who's known for this? Who pioneered this kind of uh, method of production? Yeah. No, not companies, countries. Because it's actually specific to place. What country, and, and you're, not, you're not incorrect by saying, you know, individual companies. To be honest, uh, a lot of companies have migrated over to this now. And given where we are with, with, with the telecom stuff, it becomes very easy. Uh, inventory systems are so advanced now uh, that, you know, shipments are like Walmart, for example. Uh, orders are being placed without you even realizing that they're being placed, right? There's advanced inventory systems which place orders once these certain thresholds are made. There's notifications and things automatically happen in those types of ways. That's from a retail side, but all types of operations function that way now. Just the way it is. Yes. Japan. Yeah, think about this. Japan is a, is a resource poor, yeah? A resource poor country, uh, which is able to compete and industrialize like resource rich countries. And a big part of that had to do with the fact that, I mean, there's lots of reasons, but. Um, uh, there's huge advantage in terms of how they did business and relationship building and things of that nature. Um, in the 80s, the Japanese industries, a lot of them, automotive specifically, uh, used uh, just-in-time inventory systems to basically uh, reduce some of that waste and efficiencies yeah? from not ordering just as you need it. Uh, that was a huge competitive advantage for Japanese industries in the 80s. The problem was that competitive advantage only was only lasted for a very short amount of time. Eventually, what, what happened? Eventually, what happened? Yeah. Fordism, like what do you call it? The conveyor belt. Uh, that happened before this, right? So auto manufacturing, so Fordism, as opposed to lean production, Fordism happened first, within then transition to lean production, which kind of hints at what happens. Um, in terms of what happened to the Japanese advantage of being able to produce in those certain ways, what happened? Other people did what? They mimic it. Yeah? Those advantages become, like, they, they basically get limited. Right? They realize that there's advantage in doing those things. Um, and those technologies start to transfer across space. They move across borders. Does that make sense? So again, those advantages, those competitive advantages appear and disappear rapidly. Right? They appear and disappear quite quickly. Uh, they're not permanent. Okay? Um, a lot of the advantages uh, that do exist are usually driven by technology nowadays, right? They're usually technological uh, um, um, uh, initiatives uh, that make production, make the production process more efficient. Yeah? Technology is a huge component of that. Um, it's, uh, again, as I mentioned, it's a lot easier to control inventories nowadays than ever before. Yeah? The ability to communicate has changed a lot of this. Yeah? In terms of how these things actually happen, how they work um, in practice. 
Okay? So again, major reduction in inventory costs. At a micro level, we can look at OLI theory uh, to basically help us understand um, to understand the reasons why a company would want to be competition. But uh, the three things that's in OLI theory are ownership specific advantages, the second is location specific advantages, and the third is internalization. Um, so we're going to look at these three. Um, in terms of why a company would want to become a TNC. So the first one, ownership-specific advantages. Here we're talking about assets that firm controls that other firms do not have. So an example of this would be, just in time, inventory systems. Yeah? It would be an example of this. Uh, that was an ownership-specific advantage of companies that, were, that, that basically came from a specific area of the world. Um, so, if you think about some of these assets, they might even be perceived assets as opposed to real ones, right? So think about Apple, yeah? Um, and your reputation, right, that exists. Is that, is that an advantage? Is that an ownership-specific advantage for a company like Apple, the reputation? Let me ask a question. Do, do, do Macs get viruses? Who thinks Macs don't get viruses? If I asked say five years ago, have the thoughts whether Mac put the hand up, they got it Never get a virus. It's a lie. Uh, Macs do get viruses. Yeah? They're not immune to viruses. Yeah? Do they get fewer viruses? Yeah, yeah how come? Yeah? Less users. Less people. Less users. So if I'm going to spend the time to come up with some sort of scheme to take money from people or to corrupt their systems, Am I going to be more inclined to do it where there's more? So volume plays a role. Not the only reason, but volume definitely plays a role in that. Yeah? Uh, what's the best watch in the world? The most expensive watch in the world? Sure, I don't know if it is. It might be. Maybe not. But I can tell you, I think a Rolex every time I think about expensive watches. Why? Because he told me to. Yeah? Save car in the world. I think we talked about this. Yeah, sure. Anyone here crash a Volvo? Then repeat the crash of another car? Of course not. That'd be stupid. Yeah? That'd be a smart thing to do. The reality is, is that you have companies that have certain reputations, and those are some ownership-specific advantages. They control some of those things. Yeah? Think about Lululemon. Bring to our retail side for a second. Yeah, that's the point. So again, there could be perceived. So I want to be. I want to be. Want to be clear. Sometimes it's actual ownership. Owners. Um, uh, the advantages are, are real. Sometimes they're perceived advantages. Uh, sometimes they're, they're linked to reputation. Uh, sometimes they're linked to something tangible, like a technology which they own and nobody else owns. Yeah. Uh, Walmart. An ownership specific advantage of Walmart could be their ties to production. Yeah? The production of the goods that are actually sold in their stores. It's an incentive for them. Anyway, Blue Lemon. What is Blue Lemon sell? Not just tights. They sell clothing for men and women for yoga. Um, anyone here own Blue Lemon stuff? Hands up? Yeah? They have com most comfortable shorts I own. Yeah? Uh, I tell you, I, I don't do yoga. Never done yoga. Yeah. How many people that are wearing or that were wearing the lemon did actual yoga? In 2006, when it first opened the store on Queen Street, and people lined up to buy a sweater, a pair of pants, or whatever, uh, the majority of their clientele were not participating in that activity. Yeah? They had patents at the time on their clothing. Right? Technology. Right there. They had smart clothing which moved in certain ways, which allowed them to do certain things, had breathability and all these things. They had like patents on their clothing lines. Any company, one of the only companies um, of leisurely goods, I, mean, I call it leisure high-end, uh, that experienced growth during the Great Recession. Yeah? They actually grew during that time. Those are advantages for that individual company. They sell something, those pens, those ideas. Uh, they also sell um, 
uh, a way of life. You have to remember the bag, right? I'm telling you how wonderful you are inside. You're beautiful inside and out. Yeah? I would like people have them on the, on the subway and I would just read them and you feel so much better, didn't you? Yes. So they still got the bag of those hogans. Then the CEO comes out and does what? For the brands, ownership is the advantage they have, right? In this marketplace is what they're trying to sell. A lifestyle. They're selling a lifestyle. And to do with what they're selling. They're selling a lifestyle. What did the CEO of the company do? Did they say? When somebody put their pants on and they were a bit sheer. The company do. They release a statement. So the statement say, anyone that knows this? At least a statement, no, you guys should know this. It was all over the media, man. The social media blew up with it. They basically said, if your body's a certain of a, of a certain type, you shouldn't be wearing our clothes. <laughs> uh, that's pretty contradictory to what your bag says. Yeah? Your bag's telling you that I'm beautiful from the inside out, but if I want to be more you know, if I want to exercise a little bit and I want to make myself better, I can buy your pants and then do some of this stuff and, and it's perfect, right? That's what it's saying. I want to hear from my wife, my wife is yoga, I know that she gets me to do this like one foot, five, eight, nine, hands up, and this is more very well for me, five hundred bucks more. It's the only yoga move I know. Alright. Is that contradictory to what they're trying to sell? That was bad. Bad for them. That was not even like, that was not cool. That was problematic. You don't say those things. As a CEO of a company, you say, uh, yeah, yeah, something's wrong with our pants. We're going to fix the problem. Make sure it doesn't happen anymore. That's the right answer. Yeah? Not blaming the person that went and actually spent $160 on those pair of pants. Saying, hey, it's your body shape that's the problem. Yeah? You lose ownership specific advantages pretty quickly. Yeah? Perceptions. Bad yeah, reputations. You think about uh, you know, the things that you buy and why you buy them. Okay? On top of these ownership specific advantages, you have location specific advantages. Yeah? So these are local factors that make it profitable for a firm to use its assets at that location. So Walmart's a really good example of this. They choose to purchase their products from certain markets where the production costs are lower. Yeah? If I, if I talk about Walmart, where I say, well, what does Walmart sell? What do they sell besides everything? What's their price point? Who are they reaching? In my opinion, it's everyone, but who are they reaching? What's the price point? Low, right? Low price is guaranteed. The lowest price. Their margins aren't large. They're not as large as, let's say, a Lululemon. They're not as large as, you know, some high-end fashion retailers that are getting product made at pennies on the dollar and are retailing it for hundreds of dollars. Yeah? That's not what they are. Okay. Low margins, high volume. That's what they got. That's their business model. Because the margins are small, they need to get the cost of products as low as humanly possible. And so they look for location-specific advantages in certain markets to produce those products at that cost. It's the only way that they can function. Yeah? It's the only way that they can compete in that way. They look for markets that have that. Remember, right? they have the ability to move in there and use it. The Gap does this as well, right? The margins are a little bit different. But they look for location specific advantages to gain certain things. It doesn't have to be for that. How about Silicon Valley? If I'm in the IT world and I'm developing something, let's say I have this brand new streaming product. Yeah? I have a streaming service that allows you to stream uh, sports. Yeah? There's an actual company out there that actually does this. Uh, they're called um, uh, New Line. They do a lot of college sports. They have the, they have the, the NHL Game Center uh, package until they lost it last year. Their stock kind of took a, a dump. But 
it was literally, somebody screams college, college sports. Let's say I have, I have a kid to go play water polo in Wisconsin. Yeah? I can watch water polo in Wisconsin. I can watch my kid participate in these sports events without actually going to Wisconsin. It's pretty odd. Like, I mean, if you think about the office, where do you think the company is located? In the States, yeah. Where? Well, that would be all of the United States. Sports are played everywhere in the U.S. It's a huge market, yeah, for uh, student athletes. Yeah. It's exactly where they are. Yeah? Right? Northern California, a big part of the reason why they're there is because of tacit knowledge. They want to be in the hub. Not only, yeah, not only for the value of learning, right? From people in your industry, but also for a labor force. There is a market of work of workers that have a certain skill set that are there and available to you. Yeah? So it's not just about lower production costs. There's other incentives in these types of places for these types of things to actually happen. Right? For these types of activities, rather. Um, and, and internalization, ultimately internalization. Um, right? So here you might want to maintain control and maximize the profit of the transaction. A firm will keep their transactions within the firm. Uh, so you might want to control your production chain, um, and you might not want to outsource certain types of activities. So for example, um, R&D. Yeah, people are very um, uh, you know, secretive about those types of things because that's where their competitive advantage lies. Um, other examples of an internalization is you've got Starbucks. Yeah? Starbucks makes coffee. Starbucks decides to buy a farm, a coffee farm. Yeah? They want to control that production process, so, so they go out there and decide to internalize that production process. Yeah? Um, ethanol is a requirement in gas, yeah? In our marketplace. You have to have a certain number, uh, a certain amount of ethanol um, in, in your fuel. Okay? Um, so you go to the, the pump and you just maintain up to 10% ethanol. Yeah, you guys read this at the pump? Okay, we'll get into what why that exists, uh, the value of ethanol. Uh, the point of ethanol, why these industries actually happen. But let's say I'm a gas company, and I'm required by law to have a certain amount of ethanol in my in my gas. Would it be smart for me to go buy a corn farm? That's where I have the ethanol can be made from multiple things, but one thing that's made from is corn. Yeah? So would it be smart for me to go buy a corn farm and control that? Control that production process to actually have it to have actual ownership over that, is there some sort of incentive to me to have them? Think about uh, agriculture. Think about the big companies like Kraft. Yeah? Um, people that are you know, part of that food process. Imagine you know, some of them go out and they buy farms. Yeah, so they might be at the one end of that global production chain, but they want to control all four aspects. Yeah? From, they want to own grocery stores, they want to own farms, factories which produce the food. Yeah? The, the, the marketing and distribution of their actual product, the middlemen that actually do, uh, distribute those products to stores for sale. You know, would they want some of that? Is there incentive there to internalize some of that process? Of course. That's just the three things. Ownership specific advantages. Yeah. So an asset a firm controls that other firms do not have. Yeah. So if there's a value internally within your company, there's incentive for you to bring that somewhere else to operate. Location specific advantages, so local factors that make it profitable for a firm to use certain assets in those markets. So this can be cheap labor, uh, there might be assets in terms of labor markets in certain places, expertise, knowledge, ability to do certain things, yeah? And then internalization, saying, hey look, we're only this part of the whole production network. Um, we don't want to just be that part, we want to have access to all. Yeah? We want to control all of this. Internalize the process so that we are the controlling party of all of those individual things. Make sense? Yeah? Okay, so if, you're, if your money is going out and being spent, so I actually want to make something else clear. The Starbucks example that I gave you would never happen. Yeah? There's no money in farming. 
Yeah? They might want to control roasters, uh, but the actual farming side, it's much easier to just buy coffee beans. Yeah? There's a lot of producers, it's, there's not that much incentives um, for those types of things. Just, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more when we talk about coffee, but again, just to keep that in mind. Any questions about that? Okay. There might be two different reasons why companies uh, internationalize. So one can be focused on markets, uh, or into expansion, so you're looking for markets, and the other one can be over assets. And so we're looking at the difference between these two. In case from a market oriented, a company wants to sell their goods and services in a foreign market. What are they going to look at? Well, one, market size. Yeah. Are there enough people? Not only enough people, but are there enough of the right people for my business to operate there? And that's important. Yeah. Oftentimes we think about, oh, market potential has to do with the number of people that are in there. It more specifically has to do with the market, the number of people and the amount of money that they have available to see if those goods and services that you're going to sell or retail in those markets or bring to those markets have value to those individuals. And if those individuals are actually able to purchase those products. Yeah? The Olympic example, right? Of hockey going to the Olympics or not going to the Olympics. One of the major issues that was discussed was the size of the market that they were going to be playing in and what that meant from an opportunity. This is an example of a market-oriented expansion strategy that the NHL was trying to take, right? Say, we're not, we're not going to go to Korea, but do we not want to go to, um, can, can we separate Korea and China? Right, that was a big thing. If we say go to Korea, can we still negotiate for China? Right? Large number of people. Yeah, a huge market. Right, so depending on what you're selling, um, it's not just the number of people, but it's the type of market as well. Okay, but again, things to consider. Market structure also, what will different people spend their money on? So Walmart failed in, 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 uh, in Germany, right? One of Walmart's only failures was in Germany, right? So we're not successful in Germany. Why? What's one of the reasons? There's lots of reasons, and it's well documented. What do you think some of the reasons are? How do you think they feel in, in, uh, in Germany? Yeah. People are pursuing a high quality of life in Germany. Um, like a high, like a high standard of living, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like so, maybe the, uh, a little. Everybody likes cheap things. I make that. I'll make that argument that you you offer cheap. Like, uh, you say, hey man, if you buy my toothpaste here, it's gonna cost you less money. I don't think that's up. It's toothpaste. Yeah. Whatever. I don't bring people to my bathroom and they're like, hey, using cold. <laughs> There's no. Do you know what I mean? You got to think about what Walmart's selling. Yeah? It's not, you know, maybe from a fashion perspective, there might be some difference there. But I mean, like, if, you, if you're going there and you're buying soap, deodorant, uh, whatever, like, are you really, does it matter? Probably not. Yeah? It's a good, it's a good thought. What do you think's wrong with Walmart and Germany? The retail structures aren't like Walmart. Yeah? The way people shop, the places that they shop, and what those places look like are nothing remotely close to what Walmart is. Yeah? So there's a big cultural issue in terms of how they shop. They don't have major retail uh, complexes like malls the same way we do. Yeah? Retail structures in Europe, in Germany, are fundamentally different. And people were you just weren't, it didn't warm up to those things, right? So it wasn't, you know, the, the independence, the, the smaller scale. It just was a very different kind of marketplace. And Walmart gets the mark. Yeah? And they fail. Yeah? They fail miserably in that market. Now, because they're a huge company, didn't matter. It was a blend, right? It didn't matter. They just counted their losses and moved on to the next place, right? So, okay, we're going to China now. 
take care of each other, right? Didn't really make a difference there. Yeah? So not all markets are the exact same. Some of them are structured different. People spend money on different things. How they spend money is obviously going to vary. Uh, what they value varies, uh, you know, uh, depending on even the class, like just the what level of industrialization they're in will determine, you know, maybe even how much disposable income they have for certain types of goods and services, maybe luxury. Um, think about the things that grow in from a service side, the things that we pay people for when you have this growth in services or a higher average household income. We have to start paying people to do things that we would have never in a million years had anybody do, right? Like clean your house. Yeah? Uh, landscape. Dry clean. Now these are things that you, have, you know they don't pay people for that stuff, you do it. But you don't have money to spend to pay people for those types of things. So you see growth in service once you get into that post-industrialized sort of era. Right? You know, increase income, uh, people start to you know time becomes restricted, people start to you start to evaluate where to where to allocate your money. Um, and so that 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 affects some of these things. And I'll, I'll give you an example, I don't know if I share this with you or not, but there's always you know, I do work around the house and stuff like that. And I'll determine whether I should do it or pay someone to do it because my time is worth something. So people don't, don't do this typically, but I do this all the time. I pay myself minimum wage. Yeah? So my time is worth minimum wage, minimum. And so if I, let's say, need to paint something, I say, okay, well, that's going to take me three days, three days, 10 hours a day. It's going to cost for my time for those 10 hours a day, for those three days, 30 hours, at minimum wage, X amount of dollars. I paid this person to come and paint it. If that dollar is more, yeah, than what I paid myself, I do it. If it's less, I get them to do it. Yeah. Pretty reasonable. Yeah, anybody else do this? <coughs> yeah. I do this all the time. Like I, we always forget, oh, I'll do it. And you spend like the next six months doing something, and you're like, oh my god, I should just paid someone to do this. This is horrible. Um, not everybody thinks this way. Yeah. Not everybody thinks that way. Sometimes it doesn't matter. A minute of their time is not worth it. For those types of things. They'd rather pay someone to do those types of activities for them. Yeah? Does that make sense? Think about nannies. Yeah? Huge trend. Right? Uh, where I live in the neighborhood where I live, tons of young people you see what they're going to take to these different activities. A lot of people have nannies. Right? Some of them are living, some of them, you know. Uh, Almost living, quasi living nannies, um, and we tell them to share it with multiple people, not just themselves. Uh, that is a byproduct of the society that is embedded in. Is that going to function everywhere? No. Do some people have very negative views around things like that, like certain cultures? Of course. Um, and so, again, you know, things to consider. Market accessibility is important. Yeah? How easy or difficult is it? For a fourth room to operate in that foreign market. So, what do you think are some things that might affect its market accessibility? What are some factors that affect market accessibility? Yeah. Yeah. So, taxation. If I go into that market, how much am I going to be taxed to operate there? How much red tape is there? Yes. Can I just go there and there's very little red tape? Makes it easy. Yeah, that definitely affects it, right? So some of these regional agreements that you see will either promote some of these activities to actually happen or deter them. Yeah? So India, for example, India had a lot of red tape. They protected their marketplace, right? They protected their marketplace from foreign investment. Had a negative effect, we'll look at this next week. Um, but they protected their industry. What that basically did was it kept everybody out. Made it impossible to do business in some of these markets. And so you didn't see growth of certain types of markets because of that. Other places where there's a very relatively lax, inviting regulatory environment, you're going to be more inclined to have business there. The reason why we see a lot of American firms in Canada, when it comes from a retail perspective, we have retailers, is because we're very relaxed in terms of our regulatory environment. Our doors are open, it's very easy for retailers to come in here and make money. Yeah? We don't prevent it. Yeah? We don't do anything to, uh, to, to, to sort of hinder that type of thing. Also, because of uh, the Competition Act of 1986 that was signed in Canada, uh, companies can have 
larger market concentrations. It can be all about ballistic in terms of in, in, in nature. A big part has to do with the scale of our country. So for them to reach the economies of scale, they have to have higher market shares. And so what that means is you don't even have that much competition. You're not penalized. You can you can um, uh, take up more, you know, more of that market. I'll give you an example. Top one companies in general merchandise account for 80% of total retail sales for that sector. So if you're spending money in general merchandise, you're going to four companies. 80%. Yeah? About 70% of grocery goes to four companies. 65% of home improvement sales go to four companies. These are very high concentration ratios. Super high. That's the market share for the top four companies. <clears throat> for those sectors. Super, super high. So that's very inviting. Right? So if I'm Target, for example, and it's post-2011, pre-2011, and I'm sitting there in like four companies, they account for 80% of market share for that sector? That's opportunity. I can come in there and get a piece of that pie. Their strategy wasn't wrong. Yeah, when they came in and they acquired Zellers, 220 Zellers locations, it wasn't a bad strategy because they couldn't come in organically. They couldn't open one location and compete because they would have got killed. They had to come in with lots of stores. They had to have tons of stores. Uh, the problem was how they unrolled those stores and their distribution channel and their system and also the price point in their stores. Uh, they thought they were stupid. Uh, in part, for example, cultural barriers. Uh, basically led to some of that failure. Yeah? They failed a lot, largely because of geography. Uh, but the strategy that they employed was the most logical strategy to employ. That made sense. Opportunity is there. Four companies account for 80% of all sales in general merchandise. Four companies. Walmart. Canadian Tire. Um, Walmart, Canadian Tire. Costco and the Bay. Yeah? It's crazy. So you sit back and you think about it. Those four companies account for 80%. Number one by Walmart is by far the lion's share of that. Yeah? Of that 80%. Yeah? They're like 27% of the market. 27, 28% of that market. It's crazy. What else? To prevent accessibility. So, tariffs, political. Yeah, they might, I would define this as political barriers. Yeah, what else? Yeah, it's it's yes, transportation barriers. The ability to move product to those places, how hard or how easy it is to get those products uh, to and from. Um, we're obviously going to have some, some influence on that. Okay, so uh, these transportation barriers obviously depend on type of goods. So we think about, uh, I'll give you an example of transportation barriers. Uh, you think about transporting um, things that are heavy, yeah? So, you know the Rust Belt? Why does the Rust Belt exist where it exists in North America? Yeah, real good. The ability to move product, but generally where the actual industries existed. Why did the automotive industry set up where it did? Yeah, the market was fine. The one, yes, the market was close by. But, you know, I think about all the steel factories. Huh? Close to water, 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 water. Close to the natural resources that they require to make steel. We'll talk about this, right? If I use coke, uh, the, the carbon, all the things that they use to make steel. Okay, we'll talk about this when we we'll get to the auto industry. But a big problem, part of that was the fact that the, the markets were closed, so the transportation costs were lower. Think about the pipelines. North America, these arguments. Those are transportation barriers. Yeah? Who's going to refine that oil? How are we going to transport that oil? Why do we not want to do it by rail anymore? Why are we putting this pipeline through North Dakota? Yeah, those, I mean, there's all those people um, petitioning against pipeline, right? North Dakota. Yeah, we're going through First Nation land. We might have to build it. There's a lot of issues. Right? Are those transportation barriers? Sure. But there might be things that you want, but there might be some barriers in being able to do these types of things. Uh, when we look at market-oriented expansion, we're looking at very horizontal spread um, of activity. So it's not necessarily vertical integration, it's, it's horizontal uh, spread. So I'm going to take this, I have a store, I want to sell things in that market. 
I got product, I want to sell things in that market. Um, you're not necessarily changing the way that the production system actually works. Um, so market oriented is horizontal. Vertical integration, where you have people going into certain places to buy farms, for example, whether it's coffee beans or whatever it might be, you know, Nestle or General Bills, buying a farm that are producing something. Yeah, to control all aspects of that. That is more vertical. That doesn't happen with market oriented expansion. That happens with asset oriented expansion. We're going to talk about it in a second. If you're looking at market size, it will end up at this. Uh, you're looking at uh, again, variations in market size. So, um, is there a relationship between market size uh, and population? Is there a correlation between market size and population? Who thinks no? Yeah, why? Give me some examples where the no is. Yeah, right? we're the two largest populated countries. Right? So definitely not. Right? Definitely not. Um, so this is the, remember we're talking about the population size, not only being I mean, it's market power, right? It's the ability, uh, it's market size as not only population, but in terms of per capita income, the amount of money that's actually in there. So this determines how money is being spent, more services versus necessities, and so on and so forth, right? Depending on where you are, your money is going to be allocated differently. It has to be allocated to different types of things. Uh, recreation, services, stuff of that nature. Uh, low income, large proportion of income, again, on basic necessities. High income, the high proportion goes to manufacturing goods and services. Which is by more than manufacturing goods and services. Okay. Here we're looking at uh, compensation, right? So you look at hourly rate compensation uh, for only manufacturing. This is from 2008. And on the side here, we're looking at enrollment to tertiary education. This will be for Canada, and this is from the tax. Uh, but Canada's pretty high up as well for the tertiary education. Um, is there a correlation between this? Between the two? Between level of education and compensation? Norway, the highest in terms of hourly compensation. In Norway, the distance between a doctor and like a postman in terms of income is, is, is probably the shortest than any other country. Um, and that's because of their inability, uh, they, they basically, they, they basically as a society, uh, they would prefer to make less and everybody make more. Right? So individually, if every, like, it's this idea that, um, from a cultural perspective, is that they, it's not okay to have you know, great distance between your low income type of work professions and the high income. So that everything's a little bit closer um, in terms of that. So they pay the people out, it's a lot, it's very expensive, right? So living um, in Norway, it's not cheap. Well, the cost of living is astronomically high. Uh, traveling to Norway is not the flight that's the issue, um, it's key, yeah? Like it's hard to eat. Um, when you come from another country there, because it's so expensive. That going to the grocery store and buying bread is like ridiculous. Just like look up some of the, the prices and things, it's nuts. Um, it's like sixteen dollars for a beer at a bar. Seventeen bucks, eighteen, and where you are. I know that I don't know where you got my party says pay as much as twenty-two dollars for a pint at a bar. Yeah? We pay seven dollars here and we can play. Yeah, it's just just to give you this, you know, this this this, 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 this idea of it, right? It's just a completely completely different type of um, uh, accepting sort of um, just Hang on a second. Okay. Okay. So uh, generally, the more educated people are, the more money that they make. Yeah. The more educated, the more money you make. Uh, this is why you'll see maybe a difference in terms of. Um, uh, where activities will place themselves, right? So you might look for employment in certain areas to produce things at a lower cost, um, but you might be looking at different markets to sell those things based on how much money they make. Right? So this shows both sides of them, right? Where do you want to keep the production and where do you want to sell the goods? Yeah? Okay, so again, 
uh, different places, different rates. This, you know, obviously these are things to consider when you're looking at, um, you know, if you have if you have manufacturing in different countries. The hourly compensation rate is, is, you know, an essential thing to keep, to keep an eye on. Um, that will affect obviously the problem the driving force behind the guiding force of capital. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? Awesome. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week and I'll see you guys on Monday.